Good morning, folks. Today we're going to finish our study of ray optics because at the end of this class I'm going to tell you that uh, it's completely inadequate. It's broken. It's a broken theory. But physics is full of broken theories. And the way we figure out that they're broken is to find absurdities. And we'll find some absurdities in ray optics today at the end of class. And that necessitates a new understanding of the universe. And indeed, this is what necessitated wave optics, which we'll move on to next. But there's still some great things to learn about ray optics. And uh, the thing we're going to focus on today is trapping light, so confining light. Uh, we're going to build optical cavities, and I brought one in here to show you later on. Um, trapping light is really cool. Um, so far, we've studied lenses and mirrors, and that takes us up to about the 20th century. But optical cavities have transformed technology of the 20th century and now our 21st century. Simply putting two mirrors together and seeing if we can make light bounce back and forth is an extremely powerful precept. If you've studied the um, EM1 prac, you'll have done this with two bits of masonite. Microwaves are light, they're just not visible light. So when I talk about light, I mean, of course, electromagnetic radiation. And you'll have just made a cavity out of two bits of wood, essentially, and that's also a way to, to trap light. And we're going to view this as a, um, a stability problem, which is something you probably haven't seen a lot of, but comes up a lot in, in uh, physical, financial, and social systems. But first, an addendum from lecture two. We looked at this longitudinal magnification, a new type of magnification about how far things seem in the image plane compared to how far they are from the mirror or the lens. And in fact, there was um, a question which I, which I was thinking about, which is how we are to interpret a negative longitudinal magnification. This might give you the false impression that as objects get closer to the mirror, their image gets further away. But that is not the case because we must remember that, in fact, the image distance is a negative quantity. The images we see in the back of spoons, in rear view mirrors of cars, are upright and inverted, but they're imaginary images. They're not real images because they appear behind the mirror, right? This means that their image distance is negative, and a negative uh, longitudinal magnification just means that as you increase the object distance, this becomes more negative. This blue curve has a negative gradient, a negative derivative with respect to object distance, and that's perfectly reasonable. The images do get further away from the mirror, they just get further away in a more negative sense. They also approach the, um, the focal length of the, of the spoon in our case. This is the numbers that we had yesterday when looking at ourselves in the back of spoons. This becomes much easier to interpret if we just whack train tracks around the vertical axis and say, well, let's just look at the distance. We'll forget the sign convention and just think about whether the, dis whether the image is getting further away. And of course it is. There's actually um, a nice visualization here of why I think depth perception is important and why objects are closer than they appear. You can see that after about 50 centimeters, everything is bunched up. The images of everything is bunched up at a distance which is approximately the focal length, nearly 2.5 centimeters. So there's that one image plane and everything's in it. You don't need to defocus your eyes to see everything at large distances and varied distances. But I think there's one more thing I want to tell you about driving cars and catching balls and um, looking into these convex reflectors, and that is the um, perception of velocity. If everything is in the same image plane, if there's no concept of relative distance away from the mirror, there's just transverse size, then imagine something far away speeding towards you. It's going to be banging down this curve here, and it's not going to be appearing to get much closer to you because the image is always going to be only 2.5 centimeters behind the mirror, behind the lens, sorry, behind the, um, the spoon or the mirror. What will happen is it will get bigger in a transverse sense. Of course, it will get uh, closer to you, and the image size will increase in a transverse direction, but it just kind of blows up in a transverse direction. doesn't seem to get any closer. This is why I think our concept of velocity and distance is a bit messed up, and our binocular vision is a little bit confused when we look in convex reflectors. Does anyone have anything they want to add to that or uh, that doesn't have to do with Harambe? Excellent. So optical cavities look like this. They're just reflectors placed next to each other. And uh, they can be different shapes. This one's um, two concave mirrors, plane parallel, uh, all sorts of different mirrors. That's not a guarantee they're actually going to work. These things aren't going to trap light necessarily. Our job today is to figure out whether they're going to work and uh, under what conditions. They're used to store energy. You get light bouncing back and forth. You can build up a lot of energy. Uh, they're used to discriminate frequency. We haven't talked about this yet. 
but they're excellent filters of frequency, and they're also great filters of the spatial modes of light. We can sculpt wave fields um, by filtering out all the gunk and getting one nice clean mode. They're also the critical component of a laser. You need two things to laser: a gain medium, which uh, has a lot of stimulated emission to create the photons, but you need to catch the photons and recycle them back through the gain medium to get this amplification of light, this light uh, via stimulated emission. And of course, we can use and will use ABCD <coughs> matrices to figure out the conditions under which a cavity is stable. That's just a fancy word for saying what conditions uh, do we need to trap light. But first and aside, optical cavities um, are used everywhere, but one of the interesting examples I found was in um, financial systems. So this is the New York Stock Exchange. What's the oldest piece of technology in here? The humans? Yeah, it's the wetware in our heads. This is insane. We have a much better technology today to, um, to undertake trading, and indeed we do undertake trading with algorithms now. This is a relatively new concept. Microfrequency or high frequency trading uh, came of age at the start of the millennium. And it's presented us with a problem, a problem of a disparity of fairness. Uh, the solution to this disparity of fairness is to use optical delay lines. So you can use a cavity to do all those great things that I said, but you can also use it to just delay how long it takes a photon to get from one place to another. If it has to go through the cavity many, many times before it leaks out. <coughs> one round trip of a metre long cavity in a vacuum or air takes six nanoseconds. So if you've got lots of round trips or a long cavity, you can delay light for quite a while. So high frequency trading uh, is a situation where microseconds matter. If you know when a stock was traded, you can use that information to act uh, as far faster than the other person to get a competitive advantage. And when people realized this, they started buying up land in New Jersey to try and get that competitive advantage that was limited by the speed of light, how fast they could get their servers to the New York Stock Exchange. Now, people realized this was not sustainable because the immediacy of information was directly related to dollars and that was related to uh, real estate because the closest computer won. So the solution was to use the speed of light, and there's this great New York Times article about this. They just made a delay line that was long enough to set a threshold of time uh, in which you could not make a trade after, another, after a certain piece of information or if a certain trade had happened. Delay lines are also used in scientific experiments, sometimes for good, as we'll see next, but sometimes um, accidentally. As a great example where um, people claimed quite un probabilistically that they'd seen faster than light neutrinos a couple of years ago. Uh, of course, this wasn't the case. They had actually built an optical delay line without knowing it. They had not screwed an optical fiber connector in properly, and they'd made a little delay line between the fiber tip and the fiber, and um, that caused some delay, which they interpreted uh, as the wrong bit in the speed of light calculation. The classic recent example of an optical cavity is LIGO. Um, those of you that wrote your report on LIGO probably uh, hopefully figured this out. This thing has four kilometer arms, so it's a really big Michelson interferometer. Those four kilometers are not enough to get the trillionths of two pi you need of phase sensitivity to measure gravitational waves. You need to actually build uh, an optical cavity here. So there's, there's a mirror here, just like in the Michelson interferometer, but there's also a partially transmitting mirror here and a partially transmitting mirror here. These do two amazing things. They convert the four kilometers into about a thousand kilometers, they increase the path length of photons going back and forth through that cavity by a significant amount, like 250 times. And they also convert this 200 watt laser, which is already a pretty scary laser. The biggest laser in my lab is only 20 watts and we know that it can burn through a hand or a chicken wing in about 10 seconds. They convert that power into 750 kilowatts. So between the two mirrors, the light is bouncing back and forth so much there's a 3000 times increase in the power. That's very frightening, but that's exactly what you need to not beat the quantum limits of light detection, but to just make the limit more uh, palatable, to make it less obstructive to your measurement of gravitational waves. And indeed, these are the things you need, this 750 kilowatt laser power and effectively 1,000 kilometer Michelson interferometer arm lengths to detect uh, the displacement of these arms to less than 1% of a proton radius, or now probably better than 1% of a proton radius. Okay, back to our regular programming. The, um, the main way we're going to study this is just by drawing uh, the periodic system of a ray bouncing back and forth and then try and reduce it into something simpler. Last time we found this profound um, equivalence between mirrors and lenses. One's made out of metal, one's usually made out of glass or silica. Light goes through one, light bounces off the other, but they are 
for our cases are equivalent to each other. As long as we make this identification that the focal length is negative the radius of curvature on two, and in this case here, I've got a concave reflector or a convex lens both directing light towards the optical axis, um, this number is bigger than zero. So we're going to use a series of um, lenses and free space propagation to build up our optical cavity. Here's an example. So I don't need um, to, to draw the mirrors anymore. I'm going to replace them with lenses. And there's a good reason for that. Remember last time how we said that when a ray bundle hits a mirror, it changes direction? That becomes a bit of a pain mathematically to take care of and acknowledge as you do this calculation. So we're going to um, keep things simple by just replacing immediately all the mirrors with lenses. And that's great because then the rays just propagate from left to right. There's no ambiguity in our optical axis direction. You can see this um, image is periodic, and it's periodic in a couple of ways. One way it's periodic is the way that the rays bounce um, through the cavity or through this lens system. We're not so focused on describing that periodicity. We want to describe the shortest level of periodicity, which is just how many repeating elements it takes to get um, a periodic optical system. And here you can see that if this uh, mirror is the same as the mirror on the other side of the cavity, then we can just write this as uh, a lens and some free space propagation. So for a symmetric cavity, that's the minimum uh, element of repeatability. I should just um, point out what that actually looks like as a, uh, a mirror-based cavity, though. So what I drew with lenses is equivalent to this thing with a ray coming in like this and then bouncing back towards the optical axis, bouncing back to the other mirror and back up again. Let's try that again. All right. So in this case, um, this is just one example. This is not how all uh, cavities made of concave mirrors work. I've drawn a particularly nice example where the ray maps back onto itself after one, two, three, four reflections. And that's deliberate because it's easy to draw, uh, but it's not always the case. It's this configuration that is um, described uh, by this series of lenses and mirrors. Sorry, just series of lenses and free space propagation. So we're going to call this thing the unit cell. Um, that has a kind of call out to condensed matter. And um, for a symmetric cavity, it's just these two things. It's a combination of uh, free space propagation and the lens. And you might have noticed I've made a mistake here, it seems, because I've got... Uh, the free space propagation hitting the ray first. That's not how I've circled the unit cell. I've got the ray hitting the, the lens first. But actually, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where we draw this box around the repeating stuff, because ultimately, we're going to find out that it just repeats itself, and we get this periodic refocusing. So put them in whatever order you want in this case, in this case alone. So now we're ready to make a mathematical definition of what a, a stable cavity is, what it takes to trap light. If you go around the, the unit cell n times, we know how to make the, the system matrix for that. We just raise the unit cell matrix to the nth power. And we're going to say that a, a cavity is stable if there exists a ray that's mapped back to itself after a finite number of round trips. So after some number of round trips, doesn't care how long it takes, the ray is going to map back to itself. Mathematically, this is described by this equation. The unit cell matrix multiplied by itself a lot of times uh, acting on some ray is equal to that ray again. Of course, this looks like an eigenvalue equation. This might not come as a surprise. We're dealing with um, matrices to describe rays after all. But this is unlike any eigenvalue equation you've ever seen for two important reasons. The first is that the eigenvalue is 1. There's no lambda there. That's a bit weird. And also, we don't know what this nth power is. We've got some matrix rather than a known matrix. We've got some unknown matrix, m unit to the power of n, acting on this ray. So it's a little bit different uh, to the eigenvalue problems you've seen, but you can solve it using all the great apparatus you know from linear algebra. So yeah, it's an eigenvalue problem with an eigenvalue of 1. And we can equivalently write this, if we take the nth root of the uh, equation above, um, as this purple expression, the expression in purple here, which is a much more familiar eigenvalue problem. So it's an eigenvalue problem for m unit um, on some ray vector r uh, with an eigenvalue of lambda. But la lambda can't be anything now. We must have this condition, because of this expression, that lambda raised to the power of n is equal to unity. And straight away, that tells us that lambda must be a complex phasor. Hopefully, um, uh, you're taking or have taken complex analysis before. Um, but if you, if you haven't, then it's time to get 
friendly with complex phasors, again or for the first time. They're just e to the i lambda, so e to the i phi, where phi is real. So it's a complex number with modulus 1, described by some argument phi, uh, and it lives on the unit circle in the argand plane. If you aren't familiar with, um, with complex phasors, I've got an um, interactive demonstration on Moodle, which you can look at. So go to um, the, the optics page uh, on Moodle. And down the bottom, I think they might be invisible, but I'll, I'll make them visible shortly. There are these interactive simulations. The first one is powers of a complex phasor. So in, um, you can download the Mathematica interactive file and just open it in Mathematica, or you can look at it in the browser if you have a plugin. Uh, this just takes some phasor. Here's one here. It's an arrow in the argand plane, plotted as a function of its um, imaginary and real parts. Uh, and you can take that phasor to any power you like. So we'll come back to that shortly. But that's what it looks like in the argand plane. All right, let's have a look at a simple example of the um, symmetric cavity with uh, concave mirrors or convex lenses. Its cavity length is D and the mirror radius is R. So we're going to write down the unit cell um, for this cavity. As a product of two things. The lens uh, transfer matrix, which is this one here, and the free space propagation through a distance D. That's it. We're now ready to solve the characteristic equation, the thing that gets us the eigenvalues of the unit cell matrix. So we're going to take the determinant of this um, unit cell matrix minus lambda times the identity. Make this easy by negating both of the diagonal components. So I better um, just get terms in different powers of lambda. So let's take the, uh, the square power of lambda. That's going to give me lambda squared. The linear powers of lambda, well, there's quite a few of them. D on F, minus 1. Uh, actually, it's minus 2, by the looks of it. And finally, the, um, the linear term which is just uh, the last product here and this guy. And that's all equal to zero. Absolutely, yeah. Definitely want to get rid of that minus D on F. Cool. So this is um, uh, quite nice because we can ca cancel the D on F and our linear term becomes just one, a constant term becomes one, and it's a fairly mundane expression uh, for a quadratic equation um, in lambda. Now, we're going to solve that quadratic equation, um, but you can see the B term, the term that's the coefficient of lambda, is a little bit messy. So we're going to introduce a new expression, which is going to simplify the math heaps. It's a dimensionless parameter called G. And it's one minus d on 2f, uh, which turns out to be 1 plus d over r when you substitute in the relationship between focal length and radius of curvature. 
You can see it's dimensionless because it's one plus or minus the ratio of some lengths. And it uh, greatly simplifies our quadratic equation. It turns it into uh, lambda squared minus 2g lambda plus 1. So we can write down the solution to the quadratic. Negative b is 2g. <coughs> b squared is 4g squared. And 4ac is 4 times 1 times 1. 2a is 1. Heaps of 2 cancel. Hurrah. There's a 2 there, 2 there, and inside the third there is a 2 as well. That leaves us with this nice expression for the roots. g squared minus 1. All right, but this looks nothing like a phasor. So for a while there, we just forgot that we must have a certain condition on lambda for our cavity to be stable. We just went and blindly diagonalized the unit cell matrix. Remember, though, that for this cavity to be stable, we have to have this, um, this condition met, that lambda is a complex, lambda is a complex phasor. So this looks nothing like a complex phasor. How can we kind of wrangle that into a form that looks more like a, a complex number? What can we um, maybe substitute in for G? Cos theta, awesome. Let's try to let G equal cos theta. Then lambda indeed looks like cos theta plus or minus I times sine theta because of the trigonometric identity of uh, sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. Great idea. A little bit weird, though, because um, we can't just let uh, g equal cos theta at our whim. That will then invoke some condition on g. Uh, we remem remember that we must have this number theta, or in our case, um, yeah, we need theta to be real for lambda to be a phasor. So we can't just do that arbitrarily. But that was a great, great start. So now we're going to um, actually look at what the conditions on G are by considering two cases after making this nice substitution of G equals cos theta. The first case is when the modulus of G is less than or equal to 1. Uh, in that case, we know that we satisfied the criterion that um, lambda or theta here is an element of the reals. Oh, yeah. When we made the substitution that, um, that g equals cos theta, we, we can't immediately just invoke... Um, that would immediately set a bound on g unless uh, theta is complex. If we're allowing this to be any g we want, and indeed we do want g to be anything we want because we want to be able to um, move the mirrors around and set any focal length we want to get arbitrary g. So if g is, if g is to remain arbitrary and we're to make this substitution then we actually have to have uh, theta being, being complex. Thank you. But the consequence of that is um, that there's two different cases. One is when the modulus of G is less than 1, this um, particular configuration of the cavity. In that case, theta will be real. And there'll be a ray... such that the following holds. So n theta will be a multiple of pi, multiple of 2 pi. There exists some n. Lambda to the power of n will equal e to the plus or minus i times n theta, which will be equal to e to the plus or minus 2 pi i equals 1. The unit cell matrix raised to the power of n acting on this ray will be lambda to the power of n multiplied by that ray, which is just the ray itself, our bizarre eigenvalue problem we started with, <coughs> and will have a stable cavity.
The other case is when the particular um, spacing of the mirrors or the radius of curvature gives us a G that's bigger than one, uh, whose modulus is bigger than one. In this case, uh, if you've done complex analysis, you'll see that if G is to equal cos theta and the modulus of G is bigger than one, then it, it turns out that theta is purely imaginary. So it's not only complex, but it's purely imaginary. In other words, uh, lambda is equal to e to the plus or minus the modulus of theta, which is definitely not a phasor. It's a real number. Uh, it's, not in the, it's not arbitrarily in the complex plane. <coughs> in this case, the output ray will diverge. and it will leave the cavity. And we call this uh, cavity unstable. So at first we just said G can be anything, but if it's going to be cos theta, uh, well, there's these two different ways that it can be cos theta, and there are these different consequences uh, for that e to the i, <coughs> e to the i theta. So this is great. We figured out exactly what this dimensionless parameter has got to be to make a stable cavity, to trap light. Now, back to the, con back to the um, symmetric cavity, this wasn't just some arbitrary parameter. It was actually a combination of um, lengths in the problem, the separation of the mirrors and the focal length or radius of curvature of those mirrors. So for this to be true, let's actually figure out um, what the actual separation has got to be in terms of the radius of curvature. So we need the modulus of G to be less than 1, which means that uh, 1 minus D on 2F is less than 1. These, um, these inequalities with absolute value signs always kind of do my head in. You've got to be super careful how you um, take away the absolute value sign. So I like to just think of this in terms of um, kind of guess and check. Let's just put in different values of D on 2F and see what comes out. So let's try um, uh, D on 2F uh, less than zero. Is that going to work? Well, if we put a negative number into that, um, it's going to make what's inside the argument of the absolute value more than one. So we'll have violated the inequality. That's, that's not going to work. So we've already got an exclusion uh, for this value of D on F. Uh, what about D on 2F um, bigger than 2? If um, it's bigger than 2, then uh, this number here will be less than negative 1 and will have violated the equality as well. So that's not going to work. So it can't be negative. It can't be bigger than 2. But it turns out that um, everything in between is going to be A-OK. -okay. Because if you're just a little bit less than 2, this is a little bit more than negative 1 and, um, and that's, that's going to work just fine. So what this means is that um, 0 has got to be less than d on 2f. Uh, or we can rewrite that as uh, 0 is less than d is less than 4f, which is equal to the modulus of 2 times the radius of curvature. <coughs> All right. Here is that on a graph. Uh, we can just plot the modulus of g for different cavity lengths or for different cavity length ratios. And for starters, it's got to be positive, so the uh, cavity has to be um, uh, obviously have a positive length, but importantly, the radius of curvature has to be negative. Uh, the focal length has to be positive so that it directs rays towards the axis. And that kind of makes sense. If you want to trap light, you better be directing it back and forth towards the axis. And as we increase the cavity length, uh, this gets smaller. You might guess that it's actually most stable here. And then after a while, after we reach um, two radii of curvature, uh, things get pretty messed up again. This is called a confocal cavity when D is equal to the radius of curvature. It's most immune to, um, to vibrations and to misalignments of the mirrors, which happens in real life. And it's how I've configured this cavity here to make it uh, nice and easy for me to set up before the lecture. So the cavity length D must be less than twice the radius of curvature. Take home message only for this symmetric cavity. Any questions about this analysis? It's, yeah. 
D is the distance between the mirrors, yeah. Uh, it's a bit weird. It's a very weird eigenvalue problem. There's a lot of subtleties. There might have seemed like there's a bit of sleight of hand. Um, to go through it in great care requires more time, so I've made a video for you that's on Moodle, uh, which you can watch if you want to um, go through this in a bit more detail. Things get more complicated if we make the mirrors asymmetric. Uh, in this case, we've got two radii of curvature, and um, the problem requires uh, more, to, uh, more complexity when we're writing down the unit cell. In this case, the unit cell is no longer comprised of just one mirror or one lens and some free space propagation. To reach a symmetric cavity, we have to um, instead uh, draw a configuration where we've got uh, a lens or a mirror, some free space propagation, the other lens or a mirror, and some more free space propagation. So here we need four matrices to describe the unit cell. We also need two of these G parameters, two of the dimensionless things that help us do the math to solve the eigenvalue problem. And just like uh, in direct analogy to the symmetric case, uh, we're going to define them as 1 minus d on 2 times the effective focal length. So uh, we're not going to solve this problem here, but you might get a chance to do it in the assignment. The algebra is pretty gnarly, uh, so I'd encourage you to use Mathematica. So we've got, yeah, these, these are the four steps we need to do to get through this, this cavity. So four matrices, uh, two G parameters, and, um, and some pretty um, grueling algebra. Because we've got these two parameters and we've got some conditions on G, of course, if we go through the math, we'll figure out what is required on G1 and G2 to make a stable cavity, just like we did for the single uh, G case. We end up with pictures like this. This is a stability diagram. It's kind of like a phase diagram that you've seen in thermal physics, but instead of different phases of matter, we're plotting the two parameters of the system, G1 and G2, uh, and showing the region where we make stable cavities, where we can actually confine light. Of course, this looks a lot um, better when you actually put it into pictures. Um, we can label this, though. The case we looked at before was the symmetric case when G1 equals G2. So we were kind of focusing on this line here. That was the, um, the symmetric cavity. And we needed uh, it to be G to be less than, uh, bigger than zero and less than two. It's modulus. Oh, sorry, G to be, uh, have a modulus of less than one. But in pictures, this is way easier to understand. So the first thing we should note is that you can't make a stable cavity out of two concave mirrors, two convex mirrors. They just direct light away from the axis. And that's uh, regions um, outside this blue shaded region here. You'll see those examples. Uh, inside, there's cases where the mirrors are separated by more than a focal length, but not too much more than a focal length, which is down here, unstable. Here's where they're separated by less than a focal length, um, the ray diagram for periodic refocusing is complicated, um, but it, it does, does exist. And um, out here is the planar case, or this, this case where you just don't get any refocusing at all. So that's a nice pictorial way of, of seeing this, um, this resonator stability. We haven't talked about eigenvectors yet. Of course, in any eigen uh, system, there's some eigenvectors. What do they mean here? Well, we, we said that. Um, there will be some ray that gets refocused. But the amazing thing, about, and there are two independent eigenvectors, but the amazing thing about this problem is that uh, any input ray can be described as a superposition of the two eigenvectors. And it takes, um, it takes a bit of work, but you can actually show that if you've got two eigenvectors that solve this eigen, eigenvalue problem, then any superposition of them are bounded, which means that they don't deviate by more than some di finite distance uh, from the optical axis. So any ray can be bounded. Once we've done it for uh, one, eigen, one eigenvector, we found that any paraxial input ray stays in the cavity, which is great, <coughs> provided the mirrors are large enough. That's a lot harder to show. OK, so now we're going to um, uh, make an optical cavity. We're going to trap some light. Um, I have a confession to make. I didn't do my pre-lab today. I came to the lecture and um, was preparing for this de uh, demonstration furiously outside, minutes before class. And um, Evgeny came up to me, and he, um, he gave me a sick burn. He said, at least you don't have to write in your logbook, which I thought was uh, pretty hilarious. So I've got this, um, uh, this cavity, and I don't go to Thor Labs. I don't go to Edmund Optics to make this. Instead, I just went to Ikea. And this goes to show that you really can get anything from Ikea. <laughs> I called up Ikea, and I, um, asked, uh, I asked them over the phone how to build this. They gave me some instructions. It involved Allen keys and those wooden dowels. 
Uh, and these are two shaving mirrors, two symmetric shaving mirrors from Ikea, placed in a way that provides a concave surface at each reflecting point. Let's dim the lights. So I'm going to um, bounce back light back and forth, green light back and forth between these two things. <clears throat> and um, let's see what happens. Nothing. Most boring demonstration ever. Thanks a lot, Russ. We came here for this lecture to see some cool physics. We haven't seen anything. You might see some green dots, but that's about it. Why can't you see anything cool? Yeah, why can't you see a laser? What's that? Yeah, it's not emitting anything into your eye. Um, this is a pretty important point. The only way we see stuff is by light bouncing into our eyes. I told you earlier that everything in life is plumbing. Well, everything in life is also a scattering experiment. The reason you can see me is because light's bouncing off me into your eyes. If light isn't bouncing off the laser beam into your eyes, you can't see the laser beam. So what can we do to remedy this problem? Let's smoke it out. We're going to um, fill the cavity with something that the laser beam will scatter off uh, to make it into your eyes. There's a few ways I can do this, but I'm going to choose to... Um, to fire vortex rings into the cavity, uh, just because that's way cooler. So if I fire these vortex rings in, you can see the, um, the, uh, the rays. In fact, if one of you would like to come up and fire them in for me, I'll do something cool as well. So, um, yep, come on up. And I've got a much bigger vortex cannon, which I can use to um, make much bigger rings, but I'm afraid the alarms will go off, so I'll, I'll do that at the end of the lecture. So thanks, Taz, for coming up. If you'd like to just um, use the, hold the um, kind of vortex cannon by the handle and gently pull on that and aim it into the cavity. Pull on what? Pull on, the, um, on this thing here. Yeah, that's it. And you look like you're empty, so I'll, I'll reload. Come up to the um, vortex cannon face and I'll... Yeah. Put on you, Taz. All right. So actually, I've got a bit of control here about where the beam goes. I can sort of steer the laser beam around a bit and um, I can uh, change the shape. Because it's in two dimensions, I actually get this really cool pattern on the, um, on the laser, on the uh, mirrors. It's a Lissajou figure, very nice, which means that I can make the ABC logo if I'm careful enough, but most of the time it's just an ellipse. I get about 20 round trips before the light goes back on itself. Actually, it bangs into the injection mirror because uh, this cavity... It doesn't have partially transmitting mirrors. I need to fire the light into a very sharp piece of glass here, uh, and that usually gets in the way of the light after about 20 round trips. Thanks very much. So you'll all get to um, come up and have a go at this at the end of the lecture, um, and we can even fire a red laser in as well. But this is um, a great way to see a laser, to stick stuff in the cavity. So we're going to um, figure out what kind of cavity this is. Obviously, it's symmetric because these two shaving mirrors are the same. And um, I'm going to stick this outside. <laughs> I did an experiment. I didn't trace out the mirror on a piece of paper. I used some optics this time. I got an um, LED light from the ceiling. I um, directed it to the mirror, or I just stuck the mirror on the ground. And I, shone a piece of paper, I put a piece of paper out here and I saw where an image of the LED light was formed. That allowed me to use the thin lens equation because um, I had the, um, the image distance at 1.27 metres. Um, the object distance, actually in my case, I was a lot closer to the light. It was 13 centimetres away from the image. And um, this told me that the focal length of each of these um, effective lenses is 64 centimetres. So the um, radius of curvature I can immediately figure out to be negative 128 centimetres. And I've configured the cavity to be about... Yeah, 128 centimetres apart for these two mirrors. This is the most stable configuration. This is why I was able to set it up in about five minutes this morning. I just literally bang the laser in there, and I can even move these mirrors around by quite a lot, and I still see a stable refocusing. <clears throat> if you um, get partially injecting mirrors, partially transmitting mirrors, without this injection mirror here that blocks the light, you can actually get many, many more rays going back and forth. And the cool thing is... Pay attention to this, um, this bounded region here. Uh, 
that actually has a lot to do with what we're going to study next, which is diffraction. This actually makes the shape of a Gaussian laser beam, which is pretty awesome because it's just ray optics. What are we looking at here? Yep, light reflected off water. But um, what is actually all, what are all those lines? Where, where are they coming from? Waves on the water surface, yep. So um, uh, how are those waves on the water surface giving us those bright lines? Yep. Hmm, I hadn't thought of that before. Maybe in some way these waves are making some kind of resonator, but the, the, um, the kind of thing that's in common with resonators is that it's an interference effect. Uh, there's light interfering in a way that, or just building up in a place that's giving you a bright patch that's um, turning the waves of the water into intensity maxima of the light. It's bouncing off the bottom of the pool, ultimately. Bottom of the pool is a flat mirror. It doesn't have this undulation. It's the phase shift of the light from the waves that's giving us this image. But in each of these little images of a wave, in each of these lines that are being traced out, there's a secret about the universe. And the secret is that ray optics is completely broken. Imagine if we described the convergence of these rays uh, in, at these lines and asked ourselves about intensity. Now, so far we haven't really talked about um, intensity from ray bundles or from ray optics, but if we admit that it's got something to do with the density of a ray bundle when they all come together, then in this case we'll try to predict the intensity and we'll find that it's actually infinite. At these lines where all the rays converge, there's an infinite intensity and that's absurd. This is called the breakdown of ray optics and the secret is these caustics, these lines where uh, waves interfere and rays converge, uh, they're called caustics. You've seen them all the time. You've seen them when you get a lens and you focus light. Even if you misalign the lens or it's got some spherical aberration, the caustic might not be a single point, but instead here the caustic is actually along uh, this, this line here. <coughs> so here's the caustic. That is a surface of constant, uh, of, of very high density of ray bundles, and that would be an infinite intensity region. But you probably know them from looking at spherical reflectors and the kind of patterns you see here, and here, and in your coffee cup. So if you haven't seen this phenomena, look in your wine glass or coffee cup next time and, and think about these surfaces uh, as a breakdown of ray optics. And here's, um, unfortunately, a simulation of a, coffee, a, a cup of coffee. But um, yeah, you can move your coffee cup around and make these caustics uh, dance. Here's some caustics, which remind you that there's beauty in trash. Um, this is uh, a picture outside um, the law lecture theatres that I came across uh, with these beautiful candle flames of caustics being made from the surfaces of the rubbish bins. Again, you're looking at the breakdown of ray optics here. It tells us that we need a better theory. Let's try and make some caustics. So I'm actually trying to um, get this reflection and you can sort of see uh, if it was a bit darker, I'd have some regions of very high intensity bouncing off my, my laptop screen. <clears throat> so um, I do encourage you to come down because we have a bit of time to play with the cavity before you leave class and fire some giant vortex rings. Um, but before the next class, we're going to move on to waves next and there's a few things I'd like you to revise or dust the cobwebs off from. Um, and they have to do with the very simple things like plane waves and spherical waves. These two are absurd, and um, we'll find out why in the next class. And for a couple of weeks, we're going to be spending time uh, figuring out how to remedy the absurdity of, um, of plane and spherical waves. Yeah, so come down and um, have a play. <laughs>